Hello, and welcome to the Art Exhibit and Meet the Artist event for Philip Piercy. This is the Virginia Beach Public Library. I'm Sandy Hopkins, Adult Services Librarian for the Virginia Beach Public Library. And Robert Kennedy is here. He is our Volunteer Art Gallery Coordinator with the Central Library. After our presentation tonight, Rob and Philip, the artist, will engage in a question and answer session. Rob, please introduce our artist tonight. Thanks very much, Sandy, and welcome to all. We appreciate you joining us. We are very pleased to welcome artist Philip John Piercy, whose media includes paint, photography, and fiber, the feature of this show, a 2017 Bachelor of Fine Arts graduate of Old Dominion University, Philip's debut art series in fiber and photography entitled Artifacts, was part of the ODU Milestone Senior Gallery show called Madhouse. In that show, he received positive reviews for his artwork, Moonlit Rock, Queen's Flurry, and Tiger Lily based on his own design. Upon graduation, Philip continued to explore the broader art world, expanding his abilities in various media. His work across art media tends to have a connection, apparent or not, to a gr grander theme of magical realism and fictional stories. His artist's pseudonym, Written Manifesto, signifies to viewers that his artwork is inspired by a story or the notion that the art came out of a book. His latest fiber works focus on new weaving components such as fiber matter, fabrics, and odd fiber combinations to produce a rich array of textiles. Philip has also broadened his knowledge and experience through art-related employment. In 2018, he was an art instructor at Painting with a Twist, the company that inaugurated the trend of paint and wine parties known as Sip Night. There, he taught paint classes, interacted with art colleagues and aspiring artists, and continued generating ideas for artwork. Recently, Philip began working as a gallery host at the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, providing guests with information about the artwork in the Chrysler collection. Currently, Philip is working on several projects, building a fan base via Instagram, and gearing up for future shows. So stay tuned. Thanks very much for joining us tonight, Philip. We're very pleased to have you with us and look forward to your show. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining me tonight. My name is Philip Piercy. Um, I'm going to show you some of my arts that I have right here, some of my fiber works that I've been working on for years now, um, ever since I had graduated from Old Dominion Uni University. Um, I want to go ahead and just go start straight from the beginning, which is right here on my second slide here, where it all began um, with doing this woven, this fiber works uh, artwork here. Um, I do. As Rob had said, I do paintings and photography as well, but for this presentation, I strictly want to go ahead and just talk about most of my fiber works that I have done. So let's see, I'm going to go ahead and start right at the first one here. This piece here is a uh, genie's carpet, and it kind of opens up to the beginning where I started um, with weaving. It was a few years back when I was going to Old, uh, ODU, Old Dominion University, and there is an option to take a class, an introduction class of fibers or to do metal smithing. And I had seen artworks um, from other students that took the fiber class. Um, and I definitely was interested in taking that. In fact, it was a very popular in demand class. So when I went into this class, um, we started off really having a conversation and talking about, you know, fibers. Um, you know, having different kinds of yarns, different fiber matters, but really focusing mostly on weaving and weaving processes. There was a room that involved many, many um, floor looms and many tools that I will talk about even later on in the presentation that are used in the weaving process. And when we went into class, um, we started off with a lot of different uh, scrap yarns that we used 
to make what we call a sample um, weaving. Uh, it was a very basic um, carpet warp uh, weaving that was set up on the loom, and it was the ability for us to start learning the process. Um, so, and I'll talk about that later on. Right now, I definitely want to focus on all the works that I had made throughout my course at uh, ODU. And so after we had made that sample piece, this was the main piece that I had made our big final piece of that semester. And it was made throughout the course of like the finals week and, you know, this time of like making sure that everything was done on time. And I was really interested in these fibers, you know, talking with my professor, trying to have an understanding of, I just wanted to make a blanket, something very big, but something very flashy, something that involved some of my favorite colors, um, definitely these blues that are in here and a lot of these like warm, I call it at the time Rastafarian colors. And even when I made the piece, um, you definitely have a lot of these like wild colors going on. Um, we worked, uh, my professor, Diane de Bexedon, one by one, we kind of worked with the pattern, took the basic pattern, as you can see right in here, this kind of flower, they call it the blooming leaf of Mexico. And we kind of duplicated it and kind of made it cascading all the way down. And um, one by one, I just, um, by the end of uh, finals week, I made that. And when I was done with that, I was impressed with it. As you can see in these photos here, um, and I told myself at the end of that semester, I wanted to make more. And so that's where it comes into, and here, right here is the, the loom room right here. Um, I had moved into the next semester where I was making more of these pieces and coming out with all these different colors going on um, and really starting to develop um, an understanding of fiber arts in itself. Up to this point, um, you know, I, you know, my grandmother and my aunt, they knit and crochet um, when I was younger, um, starting out even at ODU or even at TCC. Um, I was working with, you know, writ dye even back in the day, you know, but, you know, doing tie dyes and seeing throughout years um, the evolution of tie dye becoming even more involved. Um, and then it comes to like even this class here, really learning the weaving process. And at the time, I didn't understand fibers, but knowing everything else, this kind of really helps understand, help me understand um, what this was all about. Um, I believe this photo here. So this piece here, this is um, Esmeralda. Um, at this point, with the piece that I had earlier, Jeannie's Carpet, I started making these and the colors and the patterns, I think if anything, mostly the colors, started speaking to me that it felt almost like tie-dye, where at first you have all these yarns and all these bits and pieces, and you know how they're gonna be woven, but you don't quite know what's gonna happen or what the outcome is truly going to be. You have an idea because you see these colors, but when it starts coming together, you see this piece. And for me, like with Jeannie's Carpet and Esmeralda, you start making these connections with what you know and what you've seen. And for me, I was always a big fan of Disney. So it's kind of that reference there, but also it's that reference to fictional characters and stories and step, you know, step by step, little by little, making more of these, it started to connect with me that these could very well be real life artifacts left behind by fictitious characters. Um, and that was kind of the idea playing off of this later on for my show that I had with ODU. So again, another great photo of it, of Esmeralda finished and being taken off the loom. Again, this is a good photo here because it shows some of that weaving process, which again, I will talk about later on, just kind of going through some of these photos and showing you some of my older works when I was at ODU. Um, these works, a lot of them when I was at ODU, again, with that conversation with my professor at the time, a lot of them are heavily pearl cotton and wool. You're always going to have warp and weft that, or the warp being this pearl cotton and the weft being um, the, the wool, because it really combines itself. There's a lot of sticky fibrous matter that really combines with the two. And it makes a really nice piece, um, mostly this feel of like a blanket or a shawl, which is kind of where I where I went with this um, at, at 
the presentation um, or the showing. This was Esmeralda at the Madhouse exhibition. And this was um, Esmeralda at my last showing with the Virginia Beach um, Public Library. Um, definitely different ways of looking how the fabric can bend, twist, fold, um, come together. The, this was another piece that semester where I had made Esmeralda and the objective for that semester for me was to go ahead and make two good bodies of work. So I had taken um, enough warp that was put on the loom to make two pieces. The first one was really focused with all those colors. And then this piece here was kind of, I found this um, metallic rayon yarn that I really, really liked, wanted to use that. Um, but at the time, it the yarn itself wasn't enough to hold up the structure. Um, so we were able to use other yarns and this is what came out of it. But looking at this piece, this is what makes me think of, you know, a mermaid or the little mermaid and that was where this idea of like moonlit rock came from the shimmering of the water and something that a mermaid might wear and this too is featured in the madhouse um, exhibition alongside all the uh, the other pieces that i have as a brought together um, body of work and then that's moonlit rock again being showcased at the library definitely beautiful piece and i think with this piece here, it was really interesting because I have the design, the colors going on in the fabric itself, but this is where I started experimenting and playing around with when you have fringe at the end of the fabrics, what can you do with it besides just having it there, which is beautiful in itself. But this is where I started doing um, macrame and knot work that as the fabric ends, you have these strings and threads that continue that have like this lacing um, effect going on with them and can look very pretty when it's draped over, you know, this is a shawl itself. So when it's draped over, like, let's say an, an, your arm or just, you know, skin, flesh, or just like um, a white shirt, something underneath, uh, it has a really nice effect there. The, this piece here was the big piece that I did for the next semester with this notion of wanting to make a bigger beach blanket. And going into this um, project here, little did I know that it was gonna produce such a beautiful work with the kind of fibers and the material that I had that even one of my colleagues that semester said, this is so beautiful, Phil, don't put this on the beach. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'm just gonna stay on my bed. But it's interesting because recently there was a trend that came out and it's been on Facebook all over. It's called Sand Cloud, where they actually have a very flat woven um, towel that acts like a blanket that is supposed to be sand repellent. And it's interesting hearing about that because at the time of making this, this is kind of a bit of an idea of what I was going for, but it's, again, it's not something that you wouldn't not think about. Um, I definitely like, you know, where this all came from and how it can spread, these ideas can spread um, from one artist to the next. But this is um, Triton's Royale. Again, it's that inspiration um, from Little Mermaid, you know, definitely these colors, these gold colors. I feel like at one point or so with the gold here, I've used with the metallic rayon, um, they have a gold and that could have looked really nice in here as well. Um, but definitely a beautiful piece here. I think the pattern was called Flourishing Wave. And this photo here shows it off a little bit better. It has that border going on and it has that central, that centerpiece that looks like all these bubbles kind of floating about. It's just very, very pretty. And it's almost like this kind of raveling ribbon uh, reminiscent of like a, a wave, the Flourishing Wave. It's definitely very, very pretty. And I always get a lot of compliments on this piece. And then this uh, this photo here, I'm gonna show this photo again later on when I talk about the process, but this is where I started to create um, Tiger Lily. So this here is uh, warp threads that are measured out with the, more, the warp board and one by one they get um, threaded through the reed. And then and here you see that process continuing and you see the work being woven. And then this is it's the piece finished. Um, again, I'll talk about that later on, but they have at the very front and the back 
this kind of cushioning to help keep the threads in place until it's time to actually um, sew, hem stitch the end so nothing unravels or comes apart. But this is again, part of that process of weaving Tiger Lily. And then this is when it was featured in the Madhouse, the senior exhibition show at ODU. And then, yep, here it is again um, at the library, the showing that I had uh, two years ago. And then with this piece here, this um, kind of reflects with the pieces earlier with Esmeralda and um, Moonlit Rock, where at this point in time, I was getting closer and closer to the show, trying to think about what have I done so far and what else can I do now to try to make this body of work. And up to this point, I kept making these works that, you know, reflected these fictional characters. So I figured, let me go ahead and make something else that is going to represent another character. And this is where Queen, uh, Queen's uh, Croquet started coming in. And again, it was this idea that I had made the two pieces earlier on one wind on of warp material. And so I figured, why not just do that again with the same pattern, but with all these different colors to represent other characters. Um, this is Queen's Croquet again, laid out and kind of showing you this uh, pattern here. This pattern is a Star of Bethlehem and it was used throughout the different character um, representations that I have. And then I believe this one here was the second piece that I had done. And with the blues going on and all of this um, color here, this is what represented Queen's Flurry. And when I displayed it at the Madhouse exhibition, I had displayed it on these old fashioned wooden hangers to kind of create dimension and body to the fabric and create this idea that a person is there kind of with like the shoulders, the, the bust there as the fabric drapes. And that's right. This is right here. Um, the different ways that the fabric can be pinned up, the way it can be shown. Um, I had done this technique of displaying the work twice, and it was at the library showing as well as at the Madhouse exhibition. And they were pinned on at two separate occasions, so they have two different ways of being shown, um, as you can see here. And each way is very unique, and especially like in this photo here of Queen's Flurry, you have all these different elements of the piece where you see like the pattern itself, like right in the middle here, the Star of Bethlehem. But then the way that the fabric was created, it has this border um, all around the main design that you see when it's flat, you see it as it is like this regular border. But when the piece is closed and it's draped and it's shown, even with like the fringe, you have all these different elements going on here that you see like at the collar or you see um, right around here on the edging at the very bottom too. And all the fringe that's going on, it's just very, very interesting how the fabric falls like that. Again, this is how it was displayed, I believe for the Madhouse exhibition. And it's a different way of looking at the fabric itself, how it can be more, um, more of like a tail, like two twin tails coming out the sides here. Um, but yeah, this was that inspiration for me. I think this was made right around when, let's just say Frozen was made, but this is definitely that inspiration from like the Snow Queen or in a mistress from the ice. Um, again, this uh, mysterious person that's very cold and very, very icy. Um, but at the same time, with the piece itself being um, pearl cotton and wool, it's very warm. This is a very blurry photo, but this is when and the Madhouse exhibition was being set up. Um, this is how I had it with the four um, individuals here. It was the mermaid, the gypsy, and the two queens on the, on the very ends here. And then this photo here was opening night of the exhibition and kind of again showing off that display of these pieces and with this photo here pretty much as i'm facing the camera right behind there on the far wall was where tiger lily was uh displayed kind of like in its own work itself because that was more of a a different shapes kind of um 
display, more of like a tapestry piece, but still very um, reflective of this wall here with all the different, um, the, uh, you could say the, like the ladies um, dress here. Um, and then after that showing the next semester, again, with all of these, it was definitely a continuation of exploring, expanding my knowledge of weaving because I definitely liked what I was making. But I think at this point here, this is when I started to want to play around with the pattern or the design and then also um, the materials. And little by little, as everything is coming together up to the point of, of today, what I know it to be, I'm always looking at color, design, texture, and material. And of recent, which you'll see later on, there's definitely more of a focus of materials and understanding what yarns are made of besides working with pearl cotton and wool. And I'll get to that later on. This is another piece that I believe I made that semester. Um, this is Lava Flow, which is a beautiful piece. It was made outside of the regular four harness, um, four shaft loom um, with using eight. And so it's a more complex pattern with all of this um, undulating lines going on. And it's displayed um, throughout all the different um, exhibitions going on. It's definitely a beautiful piece, definitely fire, flaming, lava, and it works as a very nice, whether you want to use it for a blanket or when I felt the material, it felt like it could be a very nice um, jacket material, which is something else that I'm starting to think about um, in the present. And this was made off of the same material, the same um, threading pattern that made lava flow here made this pattern here with all these different um, symbols going on, this pattern here. And this piece, I just wanted to go ahead and throw all kinds of different yarns that I had at the time into this piece to make it very colorful, very fun, very different. And this is when it was on the loom. And then this piece here kind of takes some of the materials that I had up to now um, with the warp and um, weft, pretty much anything. Some of those I had, some of them I had found um, just kind of there in the loom room. And I just kind of threw it all together. And this really was, this was done the summer after I graduated as like a final finale piece to just go ahead and finish. And that is the last piece there. So that was everything that was done at ODU. And now I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the process. Now, talking about the weaving process here, I'm talking about it in terms on how I was taught myself. But when I tell you the process, there's a lot of weavers out there that do this process or they do a process that's very similar. The basics of this process are as they are, but each weaver, each artist can do this a very different way. My colleague that graduated with me when she first learned the process and she really understood the nooks and crannies on how to set up a loom and set up your projects, she started setting this up backwards and coming from the back of the loom going front, which I'll talk about more here. But I just find it interesting that everybody has a different way of doing this. But here is the basic basic. So you start off with a lot of different tools that we have here that help with the weaving. You have a bobbin, which is what the yarn is loaded onto and it is placed the bobbins right here once the yarn is loaded on twisted onto the bobbin it's placed into what we call boat shuttles and it's placed right into this little area here there's an opening there where the yarn comes out and that's just a way of having the yarn and having a good clear way of sending the yarn across the open shed and having it woven onto the to create to weave and create your piece and that's the basics of shuttles but you can have different ways of loading on yarn to have it go into your weaving this here is um rag rug or just stick shuttles right here and then they also come wavy which the way that this works here and i've yet to use it myself but this is very new to me my to, to me but you have this piece here where you can load on your yarn but the stick itself, once the yarn is placed into the shed, 
you leave the stick in the shed, drop your threads, and then beat down the stick, this stick here, either side, and it creates a wavy look to your patterns, to um, your flat weave, or if you have a pattern, almost like a pattern within a pattern, it cre creates a wavy look to it. So the very first thing that you do is you create um, what is known as a guide string. So you, you do, well, what you do is also you measure out a lot of your understandings with your, let's see, your vertical, your, yes, your vertical threads and your horizontal, which is what we like to call vertical is warp, horizontal is weft. Um, so the very first thing you do, once you understand your numbers, how big you want your piece to be, you understand the length of the piece, you start with one string, which is your guide string. And you start it at the very top right here, and you go along the pegs here for as long as that string is. When it gets to the very end, you tie it off wherever it ends on whichever peg, right here on this piece here, it's right here. And then you tie off your first string of material, Oops. And when you tie that first string off, you go through here the first way and then up to this peg here, let's just say, and then you just, the excess just goes all the way here to the very end. Again, it's all about your measuring. This piece or this material here, if it didn't have the pegs, this could go on for several feet here. But what's very important is when you come back around, you get to the very last peg here, you wrap it around and come back all the way through here, through these channels, all the way to the very end, and it has to go around the opposite way. So when it's tied off on this peg, the first way around is gonna go this way, and then when it comes back around, it's gonna go around, and it's gonna create what you see right up here, this cross, um, this crossing really this is what we call the sacred cross when you look at it straight on it's a matter of having like a b lines where they have this kind of interlocking um look to it and it's very important to have that because it's part of like the weaving that part of it's kind of hard to explain it's just, just when you see it you can see these lines interlocking like so in this little area right here where you see this X. These two pegs here, it's good to have, when you're done measuring out your warp, a scrap of yarn to go ahead and tie this X right here and quickly have sticks placed in these openings here to not lose that cross because that is a, the start, the very basic basis of your weaving process. The rest of this is usually tied off. It's usually looped into a chain and that's brought over to the loom. But it's a very important part with um, weaving. Once you have your warp, you bring it over. Okay, to talk about this, when you measure out your warp, you can have a warping board. This here is a warping board, or you can go ahead and have pegs. This photo here is the same. You have these pegs. <clears throat> where you start right up here, the very start, the second peg, and you see that X again right here. This is like that interlocking again, where you have those different threads like that, where it's like an AB kind of system. And then all of that converges to this peg here, and then the rest doesn't necessarily matter as long as it gets to the very end point over here, which is the length of your, um, your, your material, your warp, and your project, ultimately. And then once you have that, okay, so this here, just to kind of talk about that, these are drafts. I think with this here, I'm gonna come back to this and you'll see that on a photo later on in this presentation um, really quickly. But to talk about it, these are drafts. These are books here that have drafts and different patterns, basic patterns to really complex patterns. That piece that I mentioned about Lava Flow came out of this book here that has more complex patterns, where very basic twill patterns, overshot patterns are, are used in these books here. Even rag, rag rug um, patterns are found in this book here. Um, I, I took a photo of these books because this is pretty much where I learned everything that I know to date 
from different patterns from these books here. But I've noted or I've noticed that you can find patterns online, you can find patterns in source books, you can find patterns even from communication. There's a group on Facebook, a weavers group, where there's constantly this conversation about patterns or if somebody has an issue with something, there's always questions being asked, which is a very nice communication or community with Facebook. Um, and photos are shared with different projects made um, between artists. Um, here is a sample of those drafts here, this one being very complex, but here, um, it's still complex, but it's a little bit more smaller to kind of explain. These threads right up top here are warp threads, whereas these threads here are weft. The way to look at this is almost like a grid pattern. These threads one by one are being fed through the loom, and I'll show that again later on in these photos. It'll make a little bit more sense, but it's one by one being fed into the loom. And then once they are set up on the loom, you start weaving by this column here, your weft. And it correlates with this um, code right here. So these marks here correlate with these marks. So it's one, it's blacked out right here. There's one, two, three, and four. So this channel here is, it would be harnesses one and four are going to lift, whereas two and three remain where they are. And that doesn't make too much sense here, but again, this is this pattern here that we have. Let's see if I can try to come back to that. Again, here is the terminology of warp and weft. You have all of these lines going vertical, whereas you have these lines going horizontal and it creates the weaving anywhere from very basic weaving, as you see right here, to different complex weavings. So again, kind of going back to this photo here, here are all these threads right here that are being slid into, they're being um, set into the reed. Right up here, this kind of comb piece right here is the reed, and it's set into this piece right here where it's the beater. And in this part of the process, when you have your warp measured out, you have the sticks go through the first, the sacred cross there. You see them right here go, going through these threads. And I think I've got other photos here that show that better. So right here, okay, this is definitely where I wanna start. So when you saw it over here, everything was threaded one by one. So it's one, 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 one is a basic weaving. But in this project that I'm working on, it's a different kind of project that's called crammed in space. You have areas right here that are crammed with the threads. And then you have areas like right in here that are more spaced. Um, this is a good um, example to show. It can be bad because it doesn't really make sense because it's not one thread in each dent, but we'll go ahead and um, uh, we'll roll with that. But at this point here, your warp is measured out. You have that sacred cross that's going on. And then within the two openings, the first and the second, you stick sticks in there to kind of secure that place. And that's what these sticks right here are. And within here, you see that cross. I think I have photos, maybe it was shown better here but that is that cross right there and that's kind of where you start setting up your loom you have that kind of just placed in air right before the reed right here you tie it off against the loom and then you start threading your reed with the threads one by one or in this case for this pattern it asks you to create some space, which is understandable because some weavings do require that, that there's a bit of a space. Once it's set, this right here is the beater. Once it's set through the reed, this right here are the harnesses. So I have four harnesses and each harness has a series of heddles. You have to one by one from the very start on, for me at least, for on the right here, all the way to the left, one by one, you have to place the threads through the heddles in accordance with the pattern. So here's a bit of a close-up. Here's another view of it. There's that beater 
all those threads are coming out of the read right here and they're going over to the heddles here and they're being threaded like in this photo here through the heddles each heddle has like an eye there that the thread goes through and you see even you see it even better right here in this i think in this photo i try to show like right in here the sequence but this goes back to the drafts when you have at the very top there a sequence of usually the basic sequence you'll have is like four three two one that's in accordance with your shafts here your shafts or your harnesses i've heard both expressions being used but you see right in here there's a first harness right here a second one a third and a fourth on each one is a whole series of these heddles and that helps with understanding your pattern so your pattern can have four three two one four three two one that's the most basic pattern and so that's going to go ahead and correlate with the very first thread is going to be four it's going to go ahead and go through a heddle on the fourth shaft and then three the second thread is going to go through the heddle on the third shaft the the next thread is going to go through a heddle on the second shaft and then the next thread after that the fourth thread is going to go through a heddle on the first shaft. It can be challenging. It can be very hard to understand, but it's definitely one of those things that when you're at the loom and you see this, it makes sense. It's been noted many a times that you have to have a lot of patience with this process and it's very tedious. Um, it can be a little even straining on the eyes, but it is so even my colleague has mentioned it's it can be very stressful but it's very rewarding i've always mentioned it that with this process of setting up the loom i've always mentioned it as like a climb up the mountain and when you set up the loom it's like like an ocean breeze or at a water park you've climbed the mountain and when the loom is set up you're about to ready to take your slide and with that being you're ready to start weaving once you start weaving, that's where the therapy comes in. That's where the joy comes in. That's where you see little by little your piece being made. And it's just very, very um, rewarding. And it's exciting. It's exciting to see these pieces. And that's what I felt after my first semester at ODU, making Jeannie's carpet. I wanted to make more and do different techniques, understand different colors. But let me go ahead and get back to this here. So once you have all the threads through the heddles, this is like a side view, you have the beater, the reed, those threads going through the reed. They are now through the heddles. You can't see it, but it's right there. And once they're through the heddles, tied off on the other side so they don't come back out, you now take each bundle of thread and you bring it over here to the very, the, the back, beam and you tie it off on the beam and then you pretty much on this back, back level lever here you crank it through the loom from the front to the back we use sticks or cardboard kind of cut off cardboard uh, scored cardboard so it makes more of a round shape right here on the back beam to help buffer the tension on the threads and you just pull it through on the front here there'll be all these different tangles you have to comb out uh, again that's a very tedious very slow process it's step by step little by little you pull it right through the loom and then when you do there's another photo there of it once it's through the loom you tie all those threads off on the front beam here this is a view of the weaving before it's being done again this part uh this piece here has a lot of that crammed and spaced going on here but it is officially now tied off on the front beam which when you start weaving you'll pull it back through the loom and it's going to go on this beam right here there's another lever on the side here and kind of like a stopper here that helps pull that piece through Again, this is a view, you can even see it in this photo, how it's crammed right here and then very opened. 
And there's other photos that I've seen before where when you see every heddle or every space being used, you just see this flurry of threads right here in between the reed and the harnesses. And that's, again, that's weaving right there. So at this point here, everything is tied off. The tension, all these bundles here usually get tied off several times because you're trying to keep as much tension as you can on every thread. I usually do it one time, I do it a second time, and then usually by the third time, it's usually the bundles on the sides here that have to get retied, just to make sure that you have that tension. But once you do, um, we used to use toilet paper to start buffering the ends. That's kind of the joke, what with last year, that you know that shortage of toilet paper. But um, so when you start using toilet paper, you start weaving uh, a flat weave, which is one and two harnesses lifted, go right on the first one. They drop, you beat that in, and then three and four rise, you thread that through right here, and then you those, uh, those threads drop, you beat that in, and then you go back to one and two, or one and three, one and three, two and four. And it makes sense, because it's, it's like an A, B, it's like every other one. So then they get threaded or they get threaded through the opening, which I think I have that right here. This triangular shape here, that's the shed. This is that opening and that goes back to what I mentioned earlier with the cross. This comes back to that cross, this kind of AB going on here. This line here is a floating salvage and it helps with securing the ends or the sides of your fabric. And then this here goes back to talking about the bobbin the boat shuttle here and this is the yarn that i used for this piece here you load that onto the bobbin here and that gets loaded onto the boat shuttle and then the yarn is threaded through here this photo here is different because i didn't take a photo of me actually weaving but you lift the threads you throw the shuttle through with that th that yarn coming out and then that's placed right in here once the shuttle is brought through and you secure the line to give a little bit of space at the ends, you beat that line down and you just go one by one. And that's how your pattern is created, which is what I have right here. It's one by one. And that right there is, in a nutshell, the weaving process. Now it gets more complicated from there, um, but that is essentially how you set up the loom and you start weaving. So now my last part that I want to talk about is just a quick rundown of what I've been doing since ODU. When I graduated, I had this notion that I, I needed to get a loom. So I was looking, usually you look on Craigslist, um, you do look on eBay, um, for really good looms. You can go to some of the manufacturers that make looms, but almost kind of like cars almost, like they are very expensive, freshly made. And there are many, many looms in these different areas that people have, they don't necessarily want them anymore and they sell them off. And it's a way to, um, you know, kind of, you know, kind of share and bring this, you know, this skill, this technique around. So I was able to find a loom, a tabletop loom here that was very similar to what my professor had in the loom room. She had one tabletop loom looking very much like this one here, which is Leclerc. That is one of the uh, makers out there in, in looms. Um, this one I think has about maybe a few inches of width than the one that I had seen in the loom room. But when this came in and I set this up, I was definitely determined, but at the time, is one thing to have the loom, but then there's other tools that you still need to create, to fulfill the process. Um, but this piece here, the purple, when I got this loom, was still on the loom from the previous owner. So I, I went ahead and I took that material. He had a project on there that he, I guess, didn't need. Um, so I had taken that off and I used the material and I created this piece here with the yarns that I had at the time. And again, just to go quickly through this, just to kind of show you guys the different pieces that I've made. Um, I started off using yarns that really weren't that grand of quality, but um, it was definitely to start getting back into the swing of things and start weaving again. 
So these yarns here you would find at Michael's and they're very, very, they're good yarns, but this is when I was using those yarns and I knew that there is a local shop in Norfolk called Baba Sheep that brings in a lot of different yarns from all around the world with different, different fibrous matter. And that's where I started to reconnect with um, uh, Roz. Roz is the shop owner. And she was really, she was glad to see me come back again between me and my colleague. We would always go to her shop back at ODU when I was going to ODU, buying yarns to use for our projects. And that's when I started buying these yarns and playing around with the material because I had used pearl cotton and wool up to this point. And I started producing these, I think, two years ago, uh, July to at least um, wintertime and, and up till now, for sure, taking a few times, you know, a little bit of a break. But I've been making these pieces left and right, and they have been selling in different um, uh, art stores. But again, at this point in time, it is because of what's allowed on my loom. I can only make such a large piece uh, width and length. So again, kind of running through here, a lot of these are basic twill. It started off with basic twill patterns because I only had one uh, shuttle at the time. But again, um, at Baba Sheep, there's a room in the back where Roz had um, a lady come in and she, um, Cindy, Cindy came in um, and she was doing some basic, basic um, rundowns of weaving in the back room. And Roz brought in some tools that are known that are that are used um, with weaving. The stick shuttles that I have came from her shop, and that's how I was able to start breaking off from a basic twill pattern like you see right here, even right here, to doing, let's see, more complicated patterns, which I'll show you later on. This is still these twill patterns and using different um, yarns from her shop. This here was that metallic rayon that I had used back in school that I really like going to because it has a very, very beautiful look to it. This piece here kind of goes back to the piece that I told you about with crammed in space. This piece has a lot of space and opened dents because it's an open lace pattern typically used for curtains. But in this case, I figured it would be a really, really nice shawl. These works that I'm showing you here, again, a play on the material, the color, the design, and um, the texture. Definitely this piece with texture. But I think at the time I was making pieces that um, they were Halloween pieces, something to buy for right around the season. And this led me into making pieces to sell for holidays, but thinking about what else I could do with this material. This, I think, was Dia's, the last piece that I made for Halloween time, and this sold. This piece here, um, Protozoa, again, play on all these different colors and materials. This piece I made, that's that open netting right there, the open lace pattern, which I have this, this piece I used for winter time. It's very airy, it's very warm, it has this, like, glittering yarn in there that's like a bedazzle and very flashy and showy and I get so many compliments on it and every time I do I I love telling people just like in the grocery store or, or um, at you know at the yarn shop like this I made this this was made or just wherever I go I'm like yeah um, but this is when it was displayed in, in the art in the art shop this piece here goes back to when I bought my second shuttle second or third and I was able to start making these overshot patterns because overshot patterns are like two weaving patterns within themselves. You kind of go in here, I might have another piece that shows it better, but there is a flat weave, the four, three, two, one basic weave within this pattern here. And without it, you wouldn't have this kind of star-shaped pattern going on here. This, that's why they call it overshot. It's an overall uh, design, a pattern that you see that makes like an image throughout the entirety of the fabric or the piece. And the only way that it's being brought in is because of that basic weaving underneath that weaving. Again, it's kind of hard to, to grasp, but when you're actually weaving this pattern, it makes a lot of sense. This too was another 
in fact, this is a better example. This blue right there is flat weave, whereas this colorful, this whiter colored um, uh, yarn right here is the pattern itself. But it almost just looks like one weaving, one pattern in itself. But these pieces here are close-ups of a grander fabric that I made that was used in the process of making Santa hats at the end of the year there, around Christmas time and the holidays. Um, and there they are right there. Um, and when I displayed these like on Facebook or on social media, um, everybody was just, they were blown away by this. And I sold many of these. And then the new year came around and I was playing around with what I could make for that time. And I made um, the French Quarter, something to represent Mardi Gras and that time of the year with the Mardi Gras colors. This piece here, again, is another overshot piece that I made. Um, I had called these like glow shells because I was thinking of something under the sea when I made these, um, but definitely these patterns going on here. I think when I saw this pattern here, it almost made me think of like a windmill, like a um, you know, Dutch windmill. And then this here was, again, this was um, very similar to the open lace pattern. Um, I think this was different, but it was still lace. It was a lace type, but I was using those bejeweled yarns. You can see kind of like a bubbling technique going on right in here. But this too is what I was making when I was making these. I started thinking about like materials that weren't necessarily for winter time, something you could wear in the summer or something that was more of like a jewelry scarf, something you could wear out on a nice evening out. And that's where this uh, inspiration was coming from. I think I call this piece Sea Witch because of all those different colors going on there. And then this too is that technique going on. Um, this is um, a technique where there is some weaving going on where you weave a few lines right here, but then you go in and hand manipulate um, yarn to kind of knot around these areas. And it's supposed to be called uh, the medallion um, pattern. There's different like Dutch, meta uh, Dutch medallions. And um, you kind of see it, it's kind of hard to, to catch, but the way it's supposed to work is you're making these circular shapes. And it's very open, but it's very structural. And I started really liking these pieces, whether it was lace or medallion, because you had a lot of these openings and it was very airy. Um, and definitely a lot of compliments on this one, but it definitely took a lot more time to do because each area right here has to hand, you have to hand knot these areas. So that can be, very time consuming, but it's definitely worth it. And I mean, it's it's part of um, the art. I had used a crochet hook to kind of pick up those threads and, and do that knotting in there. This piece too is another, I think I made this right around quarantine. Um, I was able to pick up these yarns and when it was done, this too is a very open lace pattern. But when it was done, I showed some photos of this. <clears throat> a lot of people liked it for just you know, almost like a tapestry, like just the view of it. It almost looked like um, the sunset. And I thought, I, I called it, I think, Indian summer, but just, you know, something, these colors going on here, uh, just made me think of summertime. And again, more photos of, of this piece. Now this piece here is when I wanted to go ahead and break off and start working with materials, yarns that were suitable for summer and possibly something that you could wear like on days like the, that we're having recently where it's 70, 70 degree days where it's still chilly outside, but it's not freezing outside. So something that is warm, but not overbearing. And this yarn here is yak down and it's not supposed to pill. It's supposed to be very soft, it's supposed to be very warm, better than uh, regular wools that we use. So I wanted to go ahead and make two pieces here and stitch them into a bit of a jacket, which I think I show in this photo here. And I'm actually wearing that today, um, just kind of, I don't think you can see it too well, but um, just, you know, to represent, you know, but um, yeah. 
That's another photo of that piece there. Now this piece here was made right after that using a lot of uh, scrap yarns that I had up to this point out of all the pieces that I had made, all the, the scarves. I wanted to make something that was a bit of a tribute to what was going on in the world at the time. And this was kind of like an ongoing project here, which I still am not too, too sure about. But I had called it Enigma 2020 slash 2020 Enigma, something that was supposed to be about the new year being 2020 and where is it that we're going and little did I, and me thinking about this at the beginning of 2020 little did we know what was happening last year so i think this piece came out good and when it was finished there we go um i had tied the ends um i think this end here onto a bundle of fake roses as a bit of a, a dowel piece to use um, at any kind of a showing This was made recently around fall time. I think this was called Dolly's Garden. And we are getting close to the end here. Um, this piece, very blurry, but this was um, something starting to think about making pieces for the holidays. I think this is around Halloween time. This too, I wanted to start making more Santa hats because this was like, this was the end of 2020. Um, but I made a lot of these fabrics, but it was, ran out of time to actually make the hats themselves. And then right around Valentine's Day, I took it upon myself to practice this pattern that I found, which was a lot of these roses. And I wanted to make something that I'd seen before, but something that was white and this stark pink with some colors going on there. And this was a recent piece that I had made, um, kind of reminiscent, I think, of the flourishing wave pattern. but. This piece I made um, with yarns that I think this is the first time I bought a yarn from uh, a seller off of Etsy and it came out really nice and I like doing that, but that's kind of tricky to do because with weaving sometimes you definitely want to feel the yarn. You definitely want to go somewhere and like Baba Sheep where she has all these different um, yarns from around the world, um, different uh, yarn materials. But this definitely came out really, really nice. Um, I definitely love the colors going on here. I think I call this one Big Sur because it made me think of um, a majestic ocean. Um, and then this is the final piece. This is my most recent piece. And this goes back to when I was talking about the process. This has that crammed and spaced um, technique going on here which you can kind of see right in the middle here that threading going on where it's very open and then it gets very crammed and ideal um, right here with the pattern right in these areas here but this is my last piece and that ends my show well great well thanks very much philip that was really well done and uh, very informative you do beautiful work and oh. it's so creative, um, uh, and particularly I love the uh, Risa work that you've been doing. Now you talked about using um, pattern books and um, online, et cetera, but also designing your own patterns. Um, and are you moving more in that direction? Do you still using both or? So with, with that there, there was a time when I was at ODU, um, the Tiger Lily. Tiger Lily was the one piece that I was able to create in my own my own self. They had software there that was fi called Fiberworks, where you were able to punch in the dr any kind of like a draft and kind of mess around with those drafts to see what else you can do. It kind of learn from like the grid patterns going on. Um, I was able to use um, the Blooming Leaf of Mexico and try to go into that to just create this, instead of a four point flower design, something that was more eight pointed, which is it's kind of hard to see entirely, but if you're looking for it, you see these different points coming out. And that bit right there, that slight change is what you could quote unquote, makes it my own. But with working with so many different patterns, even from day one doing weaving, it is more or less kind of, it's kind of hard to create 
your own one of a kind like piece unless if it's really really different because there are so many patterns that really really do look identical to another um you see that even in the books that i mentioned in the um, powerpoint here in the presentation that you know just a slight a very small change can make it a different pattern but they look very very similar so but it you know here and there it's definitely it has been done and it can be done when you add more and more harnesses okay well great yeah and uh it's amazing the um work that you do but it also obviously takes not only a lot of knowledge but patience um and about how much time does uh, say a large piece take um uh, yeah, so with large pieces, um, they um, it's interesting because when you first start out, they can take about a month to do. Um, the very first piece that I had, because you're 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 used to the process and you're still you are learning the process still. The more and more that you create more weavings, um, every time you do it, you're reminded of the process, and it helps you once you understand it you tend to go faster and that helps build up your speed and kind of like your labor time with creating these pieces um it also can be um for like a scarf since it's so much smaller setting up the loom itself can take a matter of just a couple of hours um and you can have i have one on here where it took me two days to complete the whole thing but something on a larger scale it can take uh, in the beginning almost a month to two months but uh, for me it can take about maybe a week to two weeks but it is considerate with just everything that's going on i will say that once the loom is set up and you start weaving um it it's good to take breaks it's good to weave for maybe like an hour maybe an hour or two and then take a little bit of a break and come back to it that sounds very wise <laughs> definitely <laughs> absolutely um, if someone were interested in uh, fiber art and starting fiber art, whether they have a background in other arts or not, uh, what advice would you give? Should they take a class? Can they learn this online? What uh, general advice? Hmm. That is a really good question. Um, um, considering that um, they did, they did have the program when I was going to Old Dominion. Um, they had the program. Um, but unfortunately, they they don't have that program at the moment. Um, but if someone was interested in doing weaving and starting up weaving, there is a lot of different source books out there. There is a book that I featured on the the presentation here, uh, hand weaving pattern book. At the very beginning of that book, there they show you a lot of the different drafts. But at the very uh, beginning. They really step by step talk about all the different elements of weaving, even more detailed than the the information that I gave today in today's presentation, and that can be a really good start there. Um, I also mentioned in the presentation, if you are local, the yarn shop that I go to is on Twenty Second Street in Norfolk, in uh, in Ghent. It is called Baba Sheep. And uh, Roz is the owner. She did have um, uh, Cindy come in and Cindy was giving some tutorials on weaving because uh, Roz was able to open up a back room there specifically meant for weaving. Cindy has um, a bit of a trans, trans um, uh, a movable loom. Um, it's more of a modern loom. That's not so much of like a heavier floor loom. It's like the basics. Oh, it's almost like taking a tabletop loom and giving it like legs. So she's able to transport it um, from area to area. But she had also mentioned when I talked to her a couple of months ago that there is, um, I believe, a Williamsburg Guild. So whether it be like Williamsburg being very local, or if it's um, if you can find a guild close to like wherever you may, wherever your location is, that could be another good resource there. And um, I believe also I mentioned too, um, there is a group on Facebook and I believe it's called just weaving, weaving and or weavers. 
um, I was able to uh, sign up to that group with my colleague who had found it um, a couple months ago, and many photos are shared on there. But also, when somebody comes across issues um, that any kind of problems are mentioned on that group, and we're very um, welcome to help anybody on that group. Um, and there is also um, uh, tutorials here and there um, on YouTube. Okay. Oh, good. That's very, very helpful. Uh, a lot of different uh, resources there. Now, if uh, people are interested in buying your work, uh, they would contact you through um, the your website, I assume? Yeah. Um, so, with um, if you're interested in buying my work, um, I have, like, on this slide here, I have my information here. A lot of the newer works that I have um, made are featured on my Instagram, uh, written manifesto, two underscores in between the two words, but there's also my website, uh, pjpurc.com. On that website, there is um, a page there with my phone number, um, with some contact information um, to get in touch with me if you're interested in um, either buying some of my work or if you're interested in um, possibly a commission. Um, I do have some locations as well where I have um, some work featured. Uh, there is a shop out in Virginia Beach called The Art Of, and it's a recent shop that opened um, right before um, the right before COVID. Um, they are still there. They're doing very, very good right now. Uh, they are on Bonnie Road in Virginia Beach, and it is called The Art Of. They tend to go with that name, but sometimes you'll hear them say the art of VB. And then in Norfolk, there is a shop on the corner, pretty much on Granby Street in Riverview. It's called Quixotic Arts. Um, and both of those, both of those, they, you can find them on Facebook or Instagram. Okay, well, good. Well, great. Well, we hope that uh, uh, encourage people to do that. Again, we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us and beautiful, gorgeous artwork. So, uh, yes, yeah, so keep up the great work. And uh, we thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, join us again next month. We'll feature another artist, Anne May, who does etchings and lino cuts. And uh, again, thanks very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you.